So once again, welcome to the Cloud DNA Essential Guide Introduction to Citrix Netscaler for May 2013. It's uh, probably relevant to just have a little bit of a check back, though, to understand where Netscaler comes from for those who are not quite familiar. We started out in 1998, same time as Google. And over the past 15 years, happy birthday, Netscaler. It's grown to support over 75% of global internet users on a daily basis. That's quite an achievement. And that's it by 10 million plus global websites, all fronted by Netscaler. Now, clearly today, we're using the go-to uh, technologies from Citrix Online, and that's obviously delivered by Netscaler. If you're watching this on the repeats on uh, YouTube, well, similarly, YouTube is powered by Netscaler. And if you've Googled introduction to Netscaler to find out uh, about this session, Google's powered by Netscaler as well. It's those large dot coms and those large cloud organizations who have driven the development of the technology. But ultimately, this requirement to be able to access content from any device anywhere on the planet or perhaps hovering above it on odd occasions, it really comes down to the same thing. Regardless of the size of your organization, the challenges are the same. It comes down to connecting users to data. And that sounds like a very, very simple thing to achieve. But clearly, there are a number of considerations to take into that. Of course, we have servers in the back end of our data center. But most organizations have gone down a sort of a band-aid route to try and connect the users to those servers. What do we mean by that? Well, you'll be familiar, no doubt, with layer uh, seven switches or content switches, as they're known. Uh, load balancers, layer four and above, and caching appliances. Perhaps we've got firewalls on our environment. It's worth a guess that they would uh, be there. A virtual private network, a VPN that we're going to use for our uh, team members to access our infrastructure, uh, and global load balancing, and all these types of different devices, they are all point products that the vast majority of organizations at some point in their history have deployed in their data centers to ensure that the user can access the data in a timely fashion that's secure and so on. The problem with these point products is, though, each one of those takes time to learn and to manage and to power. Uh, we need to understand how these devices talk to one another in a, in a stack. And clearly, there's a physical space required to put all of these devices in a data center so that we can use them. So the idea behind Netscaler is a very, very simple one. Rather than having these multiple individual point products, we condense all of that functionality into a single device that's known as an application delivery controller. But what we really need to understand is that the more functionality we can squeeze into that application delivery controller, then the fewer point products are required to support the service and maintain the SLAs. When you're looking at ADCs or application delivery controllers, well, look for a feature-rich device. Uh, but relevant features, things that are going to be useful for yourself. Uh, with Netscaler, there's over 2,000 features on the box, and we're not going to clearly go through all of those today. To make life easy, the Netscaler is uh, split by addition. So I guess if you were going to try and spec one of these out for your own environment, the first question is, what do I actually want it to do? Now, standard edition is our entry level device in terms of functionality. That does your traditional load balancing, a little bit of content switching in there as well for the clever stuff. There's a VPN in there, and those with Zen Desktop or Zen App environments will notice web interface sits on there as well. If you are using Zen App and Zen Desktop, but you're not using Netscaler in front of it, there are some really compelling reasons why you should do so. And again, let's get uh, chatting. Let's have a little talk offline, and we'll happily fill you in the blanks with that. If you need a bit more functionality, a bit of surge protection and the like, then we can go to the Enterprise Edition. And similarly, the Platinum Edition fills up that feature set with more advanced features uh, for those slightly larger environments or those with slightly more complex requirements. Okay, let's just take a little peek at a couple of these that might not be familiar. Data stream is something that's really, really hot for a lot of our customers at the moment at Cloud DNA. And this is the ability to reduce the latency and increase the performance of SQL environments. Now, currently, this is supported by Microsoft SQL Server environments and for Oracle MySQL. But what this allows us to do is increase the number of queries per server instance. As a result of that, it means we can squeeze more users per physical server. That means that we can clearly reduce the costs involved in that. But also, it reduces the latency as well. Now, we're not going to go into the detail of how this works. You can pick that up on another one of our focus 
uh, webinar sessions. But ultimately, if you're using SQL and you're starting to scratch your head about big data, check this feature out. It's going to become really useful for a lot of organizations. And there's a fantastic case study that's just been published on Citrix.com from an organization called Bet365 who've done exactly that, optimized their SQL environment using that feature. OK, global server load balancing, something that's really useful for a lot of organizations historically. My primary data center falls over, so I point my users at a secondary data center, a disaster recovery suite. That's fine. We could do that and ask them to go to a different URL. But in this instance, global server load balancing can automate that process. Start to get a little bit more clever, and we can spill over for additional capacity, either into our secondary site or into the cloud. Or we can use proximity load balancing to understand where that particular user is coming in from and point them to their closest resource. Now, that could be for performance benefits in terms of latency. If they're in the southern hemisphere, let's point them to a data center down there. Or alternatively, it could be just for language purposes to ensure that the user is getting the best possible experience in terms of what we would like them to see when they come in and ultimately that they come back. It's worth having a look into, and there's a lot of organizations moving around to this, as we're trying to sweat the assets and reduce the number of global data centers to support the user count. Okay, what else have we got? Advanced server offload. There's loads and loads of information about this on Citrix.com and on our own website, cloudDNA.co. Having a look at ways of reducing the back-end server workload, and Citrix has been very, very good at this because the NetScaler product is born of the dot-com age. They understand the problems that come about when trying to deliver content out to users. So by default, if we can remove some of those resource-intensive application requirements, things like SSL encryption, TCP connection management, and things like data compression, then we can reduce the server count by around 60%, but still deliver the same amount of content out to the users. This is clearly a massive benefit for efficiency purposes. Lots of information about that on our website as well, but let's have a look at another couple of bits. Next week, we'll be looking at CloudBridge in, in detail, but CloudBridge Connector gives us a way to be able to extend our own data center into the cloud. It gives us a seamless and secure method of being able to take the benefit of cloud computing. Maybe that's just number crunching and computational resource. But we could do that in an optimized fashion as well. So again, if hybrid clouds are on your agenda, make sure you check this feature out. It'll become really useful in the future weeks and months. Application firewall, well, of course, we can manage firewalls on the front end of the infrastructure. We're not talking about that here. We're going that granular level down. So those organizations that need to perhaps take credit card details and hit PCI DSS requirements, application firewall can stop uh, that malicious activity through things like SQL injection, where a user may put some code into a field that should have a username and password, and that allows them to access a trapdoor into that data storage area. All of these kind of attacks are really becoming quite clever. So you need to step your game up if you need, if you need to make sure that your SLAs are not going to be impacted by malicious activity. Uh, DOS and DDoS attacks are something that's very, very high on the radar for a lot of organizations at the moment. And simply, uh, Netscaler has the ability to combine many of those components of the security, not all of them, but many of them, into that single platform. So it's worth checking out again if you're a little bit twitchy about how your service levels are going to be, or if you've been upsetting someone who has got the ability uh, to take your service offline. It's really key for a lot of organizations at the moment. And as I, just flicking into this last part on this slide, NetScaler Insight Center is a new feature. It's kind of under NDA, but we're among friends, and I'll not tell uh, Citrix if you don't. But at the moment, NetScaler Insight Center is in the position where it's going to give us full analytic details of exactly what's happening on the infrastructure. Take NetScaler in that position where all of the users that are passing in and out of the data center uh, all of that content that's being moved in and out of the data center passes through the NetScaler. So it's the ideal place to pop a management component in there for analytic capabilities. I don't need to put additional resource into the back end. I don't need to have uh, agents and taps within the back end infrastructure. It's all off the appliance. It makes life really, really easy. And again, if you're looking at delivering Zen Desktop or Zen App, there are specific components in here to be able to tell you things like, how well is that Zen desktop session working on the Android device that's coming in over a 3G network? If you have SLAs to manage, this is fantastic. 
check it out. There's a piece on my blog about it as well. Uh, well worth a read if you get five minutes. OK, so once we've decided what we want the appliance to do in terms of the addition, we then need to flick into the actual performance of the hardware or the virtual appliances that are available. So let's have a check of this. Netscaler MPX appliances are ranged from a 500 megabit throughput through to a huge 120 gigabit throughput. I'll explain more about how that's achieved in a couple of slides time. Virtual appliances are available for those with slightly uh, more traditional volumes of traffic or slightly fewer users to work with. From a 10 megabit virtual appliance right the way through to 8 gigabits to be hosted on your own infrastructure. There are benefits to that. It's very portable. It's very amenable. We can use it and move that component round and follow the sun basis if we want to sweat the assets in terms of license management. But also you could put a single virtual appliance in front of a particular application silo, for example. Netscaler SDX appliances give you the best of both worlds. High performance hardware with flexible virtual architecture to support between 4 and 50 gigabits of throughput on that device. Now the capacity on here is reasonably flexible and perhaps it's a good time to step into another bit and sort of talk a little bit more about the MPX boxes and how that works in the real world. Okay, so if we're looking at uh, the entry level devices, there are a couple of other appliances available, but these are kind of our advice to go for these as a best buy. If you look at, say, the entry level device there, the MPX 5500, that has a 500 megabits throughput. But if I want to increase the capacity of that, double it, using the tri-scale methodology that Citrix talk about, I can either upgrade perpetually as a permanent upgrade, or I can just do that for a 90 day burst window to be able to manage a seasonal spike in my traffic. All right, why would I do that? Well, it can keep the cost down originally, but then if the requirement on our infrastructure increases, then I can increase the capacity of that appliance without physically removing the appliance. As you'll notice here, there's a list of some, what have we got, four, five, six, I don't know, 10, 12 different appliances there, but there are only four physical platforms to support that. Taking a look at this MPX 11500 and 13500 and so on, you can see how that appliance can start out at 8 gigabits of throughput and step right the way through to 42 gigs. So you're probably never going to outgrow the capacity of that. Interesting. But for those with really big requirements for uh, data moving, uh, Citrix announced that Interop just two days ago, uh, the latest addition to the hardware solution for Netscaler. And this is the MPX 22000 series. It's only two units high, that's three and a half inches. And that's something that's really key for a lot of organizations that are trying to squeeze more into their infrastructure, but don't have the space to do it. So these new boxes offer between 40 and 120 gigabits of throughput from that single 2U box. If you're looking at SSL encryption, I appreciate this is a bit more number orientated than I like to do normally, but I think these are relevant. The SSL encryption is 75 gig. That's class leading. I'm not aware of anybody else that could do that out of a single chassis. And similarly, with the SSL uh, transactions per second, up to 560,000 transactions per second is probably more than enough to do most organizations requirements. There are uh, some who need this kind of capacity and there are some who need even more. Uh, I couldn't possibly say who they are, certainly not in 140 characters or less. But if you're looking to get even greater volumes of data through that device, then it's possible to use the Netscaler Triscale clustering feature to be able by license key to cluster up to 32 like appliances together. And in this instance, that's to deliver over three terabytes of cluster throughput from a single IP stack. This is huge. But similarly, if you've got slightly more uh, traditional volumes of traffic, then it's quite feasible to cluster either the smaller MPX devices or even to cluster virtual appliances together so that you can bring an elasticity to your environment. In other words, if I've got a couple of virtual appliances which manage the traffic quite nicely, but then I need to spin a few more up and bring them into the stack, I can literally add them on the fly. And by doing so, it makes the whole environment very much more elastic rather than being fixed at a capacity that we think we may hit at some point. Hmm. Lots to talk about, so we'll crack on. SDX performance is really based down to this high performance hardware in the background, but with a very flexible virtual architecture. It's the best of the physical and the virtual worlds thrown together. Let me explain more. Take a typical Microsoft example here where we've got an organization that's rolled out SharePoint. 
And so they put an application delivery controller in front of it, as Microsoft recommend you do. And ultimately, it goes really well. But now the guys are rolling out the new uh, exchange environment, and they want to bolt their traffic through our application delivery controller as well. And same goes for the guys that are looking after Link. So the problems start to come is that little bit of a storm in the morning when everybody's updating their exchange uh, inbox, it could have an impact because the exchange is now taking all of the application delivery controller's resource and consuming it itself, rather than letting these other guys share a bit. And this happens quite regularly. And the way we get around this is that we deliver multiple application delivery controllers into a stack, each one of which tuned to the specific service or application that it's delivering. Now, the problem we've got here, if you remember back to one of those very early slides, is we're right back where we started with a big old rack of appliances, each one of which needs its own power and management and so on. So the principle behind a Netscaler SDX appliance is to take these completely isolated application delivery controllers, and each one of those can be held on a single high-performance piece of hardware. This is the basic principle that we're looking at for the SDX box. But the things that are important to remember in this instance, if we've got one of those ADCs that's looking after the Zen desktop environment, another one that's running some Microsoft bits and pieces, and maybe another one that's going there to support our customer-facing website, then this really does become a service delivery controller to ensure that every user is getting the best possible service. And more importantly, that if we get a run on one particular service, it's not going to impact the rest of the users across the organization. Interesting. And what's more interesting is the fact that we can do this still with a single device. In the very small entry levels, which I'll show you in a second, that's a one U box. But with these two U boxes, we can go between, well, count them up, up to 40 completely independent instances on a single device. Now, this suddenly makes those chassis and blade systems from third-party vendors look pretty antiquated because the ability to spin these machines up inside a Netscaler, we could start with just two or three and build effectively build additional instances as the demand requires, it makes the whole thing considerably more flexible. With that new big MPX 22,000 box as well, we're anticipating that 40 instances is going to jump quite considerably, probably about double, but again, under NDA at the time of recording. Okay, so if we've got 40 completely inst uh, separated instances in there, that means that we can then guarantee the performance all the way through the environment through things like CPU isolation and memory isolation and the such. That's quite interesting. And there's another reason why that's really quite important, which we'll come to shortly. So the Netscaler SDX appliances at the time of recording are available as shown uh, through four gig to six gig and up to five instances on the entry level devices. And with a larger box at the moment going between 20 gig and 50 gig of throughput with up to 40 completely isolated instances in there. Expect to see these new big boxes, the 22,000 series joining this party shortly. As we start to look to deliver desktops, apps, voice and video as a service, however, Netscaler does a cracking job on a lot of those component delivery parts. But with these other vendors coming on board to start to work in an open and collaborative uh, methodology, we've already seen uh, communication from Cisco last year, and they're joined by others such as WebSense, Aruba Networks, Palo Alto and BlueCat. Well, we can start to see then that Netscaler SDX starts to become a little bit more uh, than just a, a multiple application delivery controller methodology. What we can start to do now is to run these third party workloads either controlled by the Netscaler or directly on the Netscaler. So where we saw previously that the application delivery controllers, multiples thereof, are held on that particular device, it's now possible to take those ADCs and a WAN optimization device such as Citrix CloudBridge, a next generation firewall from Palo Alto, and then things like IP address management from BlueCat directly onto that one box. Now you can probably see how a service delivery controller can start to expand the capabilities of the environment, but keep an eye on the costs and the management and so on. Over the course of the last 10 or 15 minutes, maybe a little longer than that, hopefully you've started to see some of the reasons that we really enjoy working with Netscaler. The use cases are vast. As we look to the future, these organizations who have started the ball rolling with their big dot coms have made the technology become developed into such a way that really uh, it, there's very little competition when you start to stack it up. 
Now, if you need that in smaller levels, don't forget all of this functionality is still available in virtual appliances as well. So when we're looking at everything from efficiency to security and back again, Citrix NetScaler is now the world's most advanced cloud network platform. As usual, if you'd like to get in contact, it's al at clouddna.co. You can follow us on Twitter, our handle's in the corner there, or have a check through our website and check the blog netscalertaylor.com. It'll be great to hear from you.